good morning and welcome to South Street Baptist Church. Uh, my name is Ross, one of the ministers here at the church. Um, and a really warm welcome to you, particularly on what is one of the first cold autumn mornings, maybe-ish. I'm not sure about you, but I love the kind of cold autumn morning with the sun shining down, the different colours of leaves. This is the season for anyone with ginger hair or a ginger moustache. Autumn is when you pop. Uh, why don't we uh, meet and greet each other this morning and welcome each other. Let's, uh, let's say hi. <laughs> those that are joining on YouTube, whatever time of the week you're joining us, um, and those listening on CD as well, a really warm welcome to you. Uh, for those who aren't aware, we have refreshments after the service, proper filter coffee, some biscuits and tea, uh, doors to your right, please join us afterwards, and if you are new, we'd love to get to know you better. I want to start um, this morning's service with uh, Psalm 136, but I need some participation. Uh, so when I say a line, if you could re- say afterwards, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's give that a practice. I would give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. I would give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love, oh, endures. Sorry, that was me that messed that up. <laughs> Let's start again. <laughs> it was my idea, how can I mess it up? <laughs> we begin again. I give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. I give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. I give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who spread out the earth on the waters, For his steadfast love endures forever. Who made the great lights. For his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. For his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule over the night. For his steadfast love endures forever. It is he who remembered us in our lower state, for his steadfast love endures forever and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever, who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures We continue with that attitude um, of praise as we sing an absolute classic, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Uh, Please stand if you're able.
as we sit, let's invest um, in a moment of silence, acknowledging that God is present. God is here with us. Loving God as, as winter sets in and the weather gets colder, we pray as we come into this building to be together, may you warm our hearts with your spirit. Amen. We say the, the words of the Lord's Prayer together on the screen behind me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. First reading from Luke chapter 4. <clears throat> reading is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. We're going to have um, our offering in, in a moment as well. And um, as part of this act, we stand uh, when the bags come forward. Uh, and this is kind of demonstrating that this is an act of worship in which we join together in it to give God the resources that we have been blessed with ourselves. So I'll tell you when to do that, but it's just a warning for those that aren't used to that tradition. Let's take up our offering. loving Jesus for, for these incredible resources uh, that you have given us, the money in, in these baskets but also the direct debits um, and the standing orders, the, the many resources we are blessed with as a church and we pray that you help us to use these uh, for your kingdom here in this city of Exeter and further afield. May we be wise with the money you give us. In your name Jesus. Amen. And you're already standing very well. Uh, so we sing our next song, Father of Glory, whose heavenly plan. Let's sing.
have our second reading again from Luke chapter 4. Thank you, Jan, for working you hard. And to continue at verses 42. At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him. And when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I am sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. So today um, we come to the end of our series, Characteristics of Christian Community, um, and we finish with the last characteristic being mission. Now I'll admit at the start, um, sometimes when you come to prepare a message, uh, it just falls together. It's as if like you have a divine tap and everything just falls out on the page. It feels so simple, it feels so easy. And sometimes when you come to write a sermon, it is an uphill struggle every single step of the way. I don't know why I'm confessing this to you, but that was certainly how this message felt this week. And I think it has something to do around the term mission because it's understood in so many different ways by so many different people there are theological tomes written on this particular concept you can do degrees solely focused on mission and mission alone so it's no wonder that when i come to write a short 15 20 minute sermon we'll go 15 um, it's hard to kind of Calculate what God is trying to say um, in, in those short period of time. So what is mission? For some, mission is all about telling people the gospel. It's all about the saying, the speaking, telling people the good news. Um, the words of, of um, the Great Commission ringing in their ears. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. But for some, mission is all about social action. It's all about the doing, imitating Jesus' life um, in how we help the poor and the marginalized, being a voice for the voiceless and an advocate for justice. I remember uh, talking to my old barber, and believe it or not, there was a day when I required a barber. Um, and we were talking about faith, as we often did, and he found it interesting that Christians, in his language, no longer went out on the streets and, and were preaching, but they were now kind of embedded in their community and doing good work. And it was interesting, in that conversation, for me, he articulated this broad spectrum of understanding of mission. Some people, it's the focus on the telling. Some people, it's the focus on the doing. So what is mission? For me, quite simply, it's summed up that mission is the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God was Jesus' mission. And we see that in the passage that Jan read for us a moment ago in Luke 4, 43. Jesus says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. And also in Mark 1, verse 14 to 15, a similar message is found. The passage says, And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. These are just two references of many in which Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and this being his primary mission. Blomberg, um, a prolific historical Jesus scholar, says it is widely agreed, and by this he means amongst scholars, that the heart of Jesus' authentic message centers on the kingdom of God. So we've established that Jesus was about the kingdom of God, this was his mission, but what is it? What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is God's will being done here on earth. The things, the way things are meant to be. You know when you witness something and you just go, oh, that's, that makes sense. That's just the way things are meant to be. 
The kingdom of God is, is how things should be if God was king, had full, and its full sovereignty on the earth. But in this broken world at the moment, we know that power is only in part. Jesus' life and death were all about establishing this kingdom, God's reign here um, in the brokenness of our world. And the kingdom of God is an invasion of heaven on earth, establishing in this present world the beauty of God's preferred future. I love that language of an invasion of heaven on earth. I'm a very pictorial person. I don't know how that works with you, but moments of heaven on earth, witnessing people doing the works of the kingdom, is seeing moments of God's preferred future here in, in the present brokenness of our world. Put in more simple terms, the kingdom of God is about doing and saying, a blending of these two things. And we see this when Jesus reads uh, this scroll of Isaiah 61 in this synagogue. The beautiful words that he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it goes on to say that he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. This sitting down, by the way, wasn't a stopping. People, when they taught traditionally, particularly rabbis, would sit to give their lesson. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is an incredible mission statement, if you like, for the kingdom of God that Jesus says is being fulfilled in him. And what strikes me about these words, it is a beautiful blend of the doing and the saying. Bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming release for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to free those who are oppressed. Our physical acts, I don't think this is necessarily a kind of theoretical, nice, this is the actual acts of the kingdom, social action done on this earth. And at the end, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to speak it, to say it. Doing and saying are part of the kingdom of God. It is as much about good news as it is showing compassion and justice advocacy. And throughout Luke 4, we see different examples of how this mission statement is then fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. In verses 24 to 27, he tells two stories of Gentiles, of non-Jews, and in these stories, they are the heroes. They are God's favoured, even above the Jews who are in the stories, showing that God's kingdom is about inclusivity. And in verses 31 to 37, he exercises someone of a demon, showing that powers of evil are not part of God's kingdom, of God's desired future. In Matthew 12, verse 28, Jesus literally says that this idea of exercising demons, of doing away with evil, is a sign of the kingdom coming. He says, by it, um, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And in verses 38 to 40, Jesus heals loads of people. He cures them from, from illness and disease, showing that ill health is not part of the kingdom of God. It's not part of God's desired future. The kingdom of God is about doing and saying. And finally, the kingdom of God is about color. The problem with this kind of language, for me, is it becomes very abstract and very confusing. There's many different ways you can understand this theological phrase, the kingdom of God. And sometimes it, I go home and I find myself, what, what, what does that mean for me? That's great, Mr. Preacher, but how do I actually live this out in reality? How does this impact my tomorrow? I'm not going to give everyone a theological book to read about what I'm doing, the kingdom of God. For me, the answer is simple, colour. Explosions of colour. 
The kingdom of God is like explosions of colour on the blank canvas of this world. Is that not an image that excites you? It does me, so at least smile and go along with it. You will see, hopefully you've been handed um, a piece of paper when you came in this morning. And on that piece of paper, behind the text, is an explosion of colour. It is a very, very simple image. But it's one that I think captures the kingdom of God beautifully. Jesus' death and resurrection, bringing this kingdom of God here on this earth in part. An explosion of colour on the blank canvas of our world. And the beauty is that we have the task to be this explosion of colour wherever we go in all aspects of our lives, right? Every time someone tells another that Jesus loves them, colour explodes in the blandness. Every time someone listens to a struggling neighbour, colour explodes in the blandness. Every time someone advocates for a homeless person seeking help with the council, colour explodes in the blandness. Every time someone forgives a friend who's hurt them time and time again, colour explodes in the blandness. Every time someone shows compassion to a person on the opposite end of the political spectrum to them, colour explodes in the blandness. The kingdom of God is about colour. And a person um, who exemplifies this for me um, is someone called Toyoko Kagawa, who was a Japanese, I think I pronounced that right, but you can't see it, so we'll just go with it. Uh, Who was a Japanese Christian missionary, um, and he was born in Kobe, Japan, to a fairly well-off family. He was well-educated. Um, Unfortunately, his parents died when he was young, but he went to theological seminary and then in 1909 felt a call to Japan's Shinkawa slums. And I don't know if you've ever been to a slum. Um, I had the privilege of visiting one in Kenya when I was there helping a missionary friend years ago. And the first thing that struck me was the smell. It was tangible in the air um, of waste, which literally ran down the streets. Houses were huddled together, um, rubbish was scattered across the streets. There was a, a, a feeling of despair and hopelessness. You could almost feel it in the air. It was shocking. And this was the reality that, that Kagawa was willing to give up his privileged, educated life to walk into these slums and be Jesus to these people. This is a book written about him with extracts of some of the things he says. I want to read you some of this. His envoy in Shinkawa looked upon privations, insults and attacks as mere incidents of the day's work. Others looked upon these people as alley spawn, a breed of the underworld. He looked upon them as folk. He loved them. He saw hidden in each one a priceless soul and a potential personality. He began his day with a six o'clock street meeting at an open place where the people congregated before scattering for the day. This is a typical scene. A tubercular cough has its clutch on him. Yet he stands in a driving rain until drenched and cries, God is love. I will proclaim it until I fall. God is love. I do not mean that the unseen God is love. Where love is, there is God. Then he falls exhausted to the ground and rough by sympathetic hands carry him to his hut. In Shinkawa, babies were born without expense, but it cost 10 shillings to bury them. No family could raise that amount, and a death was a major calamity. Their problem was not how to have their children well born, but how to have them well buried. Mother love, father love, knows no distinction of class, colour or circumstance. This love was not entirely lacking, even in Shinkawa, and parents wanted their babies decently buried. 
in a coffin and in a cemetery, but both cost money. They therefore brought their dead babies to Kagawa and begged him to bury them. During his first year, he buried 14. In 1911, he provided Christian burials for 19 babies. This is typical of what happened every year during his almost 15 years of life in these slums. He visited the sick. He comforted the sorrowing. He fed the hungry. He lodged the homeless. He became elder brother to the prostitutes, visiting them when they were ill and providing them with medicines. Even for the bullies, he had a brother's heart and never lost an opportunity to put God's love into action in his dealings with them. Kagawa brought colour, the colour of the kingdom of God, into the slums of Shinkawa. Now I realise that his life is um, not the reality for us every day. So how does this look for you? What does it look like for you to be an explosion of the kingdom, an explosion of colour of the kingdom of God in the blandness of our world? South Street Baptist Church, we have been given a mission to imitate Jesus and be explosions of colour in all we do for the kingdom of God. Are you up for the challenge? Some nods. Mission is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about saying and doing. The kingdom of God is about color. In response to this, um, and again on your pieces of paper, you'll notice the lyrics coming up on the screen. Um, We're gonna watch a song by Rend Collective, because I'm not sure you can speak on the kingdom of God without using this song called Build Your Kingdom Here. Um, And afterwards we'll have a chance to respond with the words on your paper. Enjoy. What an inspiring song, right? The words so profoundly linked to um, the message this morning. Um, And I want to give a space now Quietly, hopefully you have the sheets um, in front of you with those words on, one of the verses and the chorus and the explosion of colour behind. Um, And just in a moment of quiet, to either read those words or to look at that explosion of colour and ask God in the quiet, how does this apply to me? How is this going to make a difference in my tomorrow? Let's hope I have a moment of quiet for reflection. Loving God, we, um, as we come towards the end of autumn, we think about the beautiful leaves and colours outside, the oranges, the reds, the yellows, the purples and the pinks, the incredible colour of this beautiful season. And we pray in our lives that that would be what people see in us, that we would stand out against the the canvas of winter's greyness, we would be a colourful leaf, an explosion of colour. May we bring your kingdom in all we do for your glory, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to have our prayer.
prayers for others. That's great. In the scriptures which uh, Ross has brought to us this morning, uh, there was a description of the mission of Jesus picked up from the Old Testament. A variety of statements about the mission of the kingdom. In our prayers now, I'm just going to pick up one of them. The first one that Jesus actually quotes, where he speaks of his mission as being good news to the poor. So I'm going to offer you some aspects of poverty for your own prayers in silence. And each section of silence will end with a very familiar response. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come up to you. So first, let's think about the increasing poverty in our country. Issues of food, heating, cost of living, pressures on food banks and the like. Good news to the poor. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come up to you. Then let's think of those who are refugees from poverty, not just economic migrants, but people unable to cope in their own lands. Good news to the poor, Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come up to you. Then there are those made poor by war. Not just the refugees, but those who have stayed in their own lands and lost everything to the fighting. Good news to the poor. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come up to you. More and more we are being challenged to see the poverty of those who are on the sharp end of climate change. The needs of children in particular being shown to us in their agonizing need. Good news to the poor. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come out to you. But Jesus also reminds us of the blessedness of the poor in spirit and has warned us that the rich may be the truly poor and the poor, the truly rich. Good news for the poor. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come up to you. Lord, may there be an explosion of colour transforming the world's poverty and sickness. 
the coming of your kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Gwen, for those beautiful prayers. We now stand, if you're able, and sing, God's Spirit is in my heart. Please stand and sing. tune is going to be stuck in my head <laughs> all week now. We come to finish with this as our blessing as we go out to be explosions of colour. May we seek your kingdom first. May we hunger and may we first. Refuse to waste our lives. Jesus, you're our joy and pride. May we see the captive hearts released. May we see the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. May we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are South Street Baptist Church and we pray revive our city of Exeter, loving God. Amen.